Hi, everybody, and welcome to our first of three special The Nutritionist for Sheep. I'm Marianne Fezenden, Webinar and Academic Coordinator for Agricultural Modeling and Training Systems, or AMTS. For those of you who are unfamiliar with AMTS, we were founded to develop commercially, commercially available software based on the Cornell Net Carbohydrate and Protein Systems, CNCPS, Cattle Nutrition Model. We specialize in program and educational support for nutritionists feeding dairy and beef cattle, as well as sheep and goats for meat and milk production. We pride ourselves in not only offering software, but also providing the knowledge behind successfully feeding ruminant animals. To assist nutritionists around the globe, we created the Nutritionist Webinar Series. These monthly webinars join experts, researchers, and teachers with nutritional practitioners in a forum designed to present ideas and practices coupled with opportunities to ask questions with a global audience. We pair co-hosts in other countries or with differing experiences to strengthen our question period in an effort to broaden our listeners' perspectives. As a service, we have recorded webinars on our website as archived recordings and podcasts. This webinar is also being recorded. They can be found on the webinars tab by year and knowledge base tabs under podcasts. While you are listening today, if you have a question, please type in the Q&A or chat window. At the end of the webinar, we will ask your question and others' questions. We are honored today to host Masood Aoun, our, who is our presenter. Masood is one of the founders and the, present, the present director of Adina, a France-based company globally involved in developing feed additives derived from plant extracts and essential oils designed to improve ruminant performance. In his role as the director since 2010, he has managed research and development of all companies and species. In his role as our speaker, Mr. Anun is drawing not only on his experience with Adina, but also his lifetime as a nutritionist specializing in small ruminants. He will be giving us some understanding of breeds, production systems, and nutrient requirements of sheep for production of fattening lambs. Masood, we are delighted to have you here today, and thank you for taking the time. A special note of, for those of you utilizing the interpretation feature of our webinar. The talk is delivered in English with a Turkish translation channel available. You will hear Mr. Anun and the English speaking panelists if you did not select a language on entry. If you did select English, please make certain you have not muted the original language. Those of you who listen to the Turkish translator, please make certain your original language is muted. Welcome, welcome everyone, and thank you very much for uh, for attending this uh, this webinar. Uh, thank you for the organizers. Thank you, thank you for you, Mariana, for inviting me. I'm uh, really very very happy to to be with you today. Uh, as a nutritionist, spe specialized in sheep production, so my presentation is more to share with you my experience uh, in sheep fattening under the title of Nutrition and Management of Fattening Lambs in Europe between Tradition and Industry. Of course, we cannot present uh, everything in 45 minutes or in one hour, but I will remain available for you if you have questions uh, after the webinar to answer you if you need that. Okay, so I suggest uh, the following plan for the presentations. The idea is uh, to share with you uh, several subjects, okay, which concern fattening sheep in Europe. First, I will I present a little bit the company, so we'll, something about Idina, and then after I go uh, to the European she sheep sector, some numbers, the most common breeds, and the main production systems. And here we focused mainly on the succeeding lambs and the intensive production systems. Uh, the fundamentals of fattening, some, some really some criteria which we consider really fundamentals for fattening in sheep, some health concern re really rapidly in order to, to link the major problem, the major health, health concern 
which occurs, maybe can occur a bad results in fattening, animal needs, feed formulations, and I finished my presentation about the carcass pay payment grid in France and in Europe in general, and with the productions, some example for production costs. So uh, from the beginning, if you want, uh, of the company in 1995, and we defend as IDENA, the principle of alternative nutrition under the headlines of anticipate and sustainably support the future of livestock farming for our common future. So more precisely, this headline focused mainly on, all, on our alternative product we developed from the beginning of the company, which, which we can qualify them as alternative to conventional products. I mean by that chemicals, antibiotic growth promoters, et cetera, and et cetera. Our three fields of activity, uh, the first one is uh, the animal nutrition expertises. So only to mention that IDENA, we first, we are a team of specialized nutritionists and veterinarians. So we work for ruminants, for pork, for poultry, and in, uh, which uh, requires us, if you want, a deep knowledge of animal needs, animal physiology, uh, a, a deep knowledge, again, for in raw materials, in feed formulations, in TMR balancing, and at the same time, for several farm management system. Our second uh, field of activity is the, the feed additives expertises. And here we can say that we create, IDENA create uh, its product and manufacture its product and mainly products, feed additives, mainly based on essential oils, botanical in general, and probiotics. We have a big dynamic, dynamic uh, research and development activity with the really close uh, collaborations with universities and research, research institute. In this activity, we focused a lot as a nutrition uh, company in mainly on nutrient efficiencies, on microbiota management, on antiparasitic effects of our feed additives, on everything, if you want, on everything in the gut which can improve digestion and feed efficiency. And to finish with IDENA, we, we work with the, our main customers. They are the feed millers. So we, we work with the feed industry with veterinarians, integrators, cooperative, and at the end with the farmer, for whom we, we provide a lot of services around the feed formulations, the TMR balancing, laboratory services, metrics, rules, and so on and so on, until the feed assistance and the farm audits, because we spend a lot of our time in the directly in the feed, in the field. And we provide our customers a products like uh, promixes, feed additives, powder and liquid, and we create targeted, so we, can, we are capable really to customize our product depending on the problems, on the objective. And as I said, with a big experience in bioactive pre and post probiotics. Now, what about the sheep meat sector in Europe? So we're entering in the, <laughs> in the presentation. Uh, in this table, we can see that the most important countries who produce sheep, sheep in Europe. And as you can see, uh, United Kingdom, so UK, occupies really the first positions in terms of the number of breeders. And I mean by that, the number of ewes and the ewes, ewe lambs, uh, with, which, which is around 15 million of female in only UK market. Uh, which represent around 23% of the total uh, number of females in, in Europe. This, in the second place, we can speak about uh, this, this Spain, which is really highly representative in, in, um, in its herd. Okay, uh, we have uh, 11, 11, 5, 11, 000, 11 millions of, of females in Spain, so eight, around 18% of the total market. The third place is for Romania. Greece, Italy, France, and Ireland. Uh, our estimation for the total number of females in, in Europe is around 72 to 75 females in all Europe. 
okay, for to 27 countries in, in Europe. What is, what is important here, and maybe it is a, a differentiation in, in Europe uh, in comparison to the, to the worldwide, ma worldwide market, that in Europe we produce a lot of milk cheese and milk sheep and a, a cheese coming from sheep. So we, we estimate that 40% of the total uh, females in, we produce in, in Europe, we have in Europe, that are represented by dairy sheep breeds. Okay, so mainly in Romania, Greece, and and uh, and Italy, with a lower proportion for France and and Spain. So here you have some uh, some data uh, data about the slaughter in terms of ton, uh, tons and uh, carcass equivalent. And we still uh, have the the UK, which is really highly represented by a big a big uh, number of of carcass uh, slaughtered uh, slaughtered per year. The average carcass weight here we have two categories in Europe in general, because we have a very light carcass weight, which concern mainly Spain, Romania, Greece, and Italy, around ten to eleven kilos of carcass weight. And for, uh, for the other countries, we are more at 18 to 20 kilos of carcass weight. The consumption uh, per capita, uh, it varies from one kilos to five kilos per, per capita. And in general, uh, we have a self-sufficiency, uh, but we lack a little bit in France and Italy, which is still really an, an importing, importing countries. So, if we compare really the Europe uh, to the to, to the worldwide situations, so what we can see here that China represents really the first country in the world who produce uh, produce sheep, with 164 millions of females, which represent 2.5 times the herd of of Europe. Okay. Secondly, uh, Australia represents the same number of ewes or the same number of females, if you want, as the total market uh, of Europe, uh, only the only uh, for uh, for the for Australia. Uh, Turkey with uh, 35 millions of of females, so it represents half the the herd of of Europe. We have a big herd in New Zealand with 20, 20, 27 millions of of. Uh, of females, Argentina and Uruguay. So for the rest, for the slaughter, the average carcass, this consumption, you have all the data in, the, in this table. And we can see that the self-sufficiencies in these, in these countries are in general, we still have here exporting, exporting countries. So what we can see as a conclusion that around 40% of lambs in Europe they come from the dairy sector. And in this situation, we can speak about an intensive fattening system. We will speak about that uh, later. With a separated and specialized fattening building, so from the lambing to the fattening, so have, to have two separated uh, buildings for that. And around 60% of, of lambs, they are coming from specialized breeds for meat. So hey, here we can speak about more traditional and more semi-intensive system with integrated in the same site, a lambing and fattening boards. And we have a large concentration of production in UK as, uh, as we already see that in the south of, of Europe and in the central of Europe. Okay, so what about now, now about the breeds we are using in, uh, in Europe? First, to say that there is up to 200 different breeds in Europe with a lot of specific and traditional breeds in each country, okay? What we can say that in general, the professional producers, and here I'm speaking about the meat, meat breeds, okay? Uh, professional producers, they look, they are using breeds according to the market demand, okay? So for that, among the criteria we are looking for, farmers will favor criteria uh, or parameters like polyphicity, like the daily values, like the growth rate, and 
all the characteristics of the carcass, I mean conformations of the carcass, the carcass yield, the carcass, the carcass fat, and so on and so on. So on the left of the, of the table, so we can read that the most used breed, here it's really an example, okay? Keep in mind that there is more up to 20, 200 breeds in, in Europe in general, but we are speaking about the most representative breed. So we can speak about the Charolais, the Texel, the Suffolk, which is really highly present uh, in, in Europe in general, okay? And in the same time, with a very close uh, parameters or criteria uh, to each other on the main on the main criteria. Okay, so if you compare, for example, the Chevrolet to Texel to Suffolk, we we can we can find that uh, really they are really very prolific um, breeds with a very good dairy values, with a very good growth rate for lambs, and so on and so on. So. These, these breeds, we can find them in UK and in Ireland at the same time. Okay, so Chevrolet, Texel, Suffolk again. We can find them in France with some specificity for France breeds, for Ile de France, for example, for Limousine, for Mevinus. And for Spain, we have a, a big herd of Mevinus with more specific uh, breeds in Spain, like the Raza, the Aragonesa, the Segurena, and the Castellana, and so on, and so on. If we, if we speak about, for example, on another side, for, about the dairy breeds in, the, in, this, uh, in this table, so the dairy breeds in general, they are less numerous, and the first criterion in this, in this case is, is more the quantity and the quality of milk, okay? So the cheese yield more than the meat quality. Remember that lambs coming from this, uh, from this sector, I mean the dairy breed sector, okay? The, the lambs are fattened and are valued in the meat production market, okay? So it is really, they compete, these breeds compete. It's a, we have a serious competition between dairy breeds and meat breeds at the same time. So in the same time, as I mentioned before, the cheese producers countries are France, Spain, Greece, Italy, and Romania. The main breeds in this case is, is mm -hmm. a, we can see, for example, that Lacone, which is a French origin breed, it's really highly present in all, in all Europe, of course, in France, in Spain, in Greece, in Italy, a little bit in Romania. We have the Asaf, which is a, the Spanish origin breed with a specific breed for each country in the same time. We have a small presence for the Awasi with the fatty tails in all these countries, okay? Uh, but mainly in Greece, a little bit in Spain in the same time. What we can see that they have been, if you want, some genetic improvement scheme uh, for these breeds in order really to improve, to improve the, the, the meat quality of daily breeds. So this is the case, for example, of Lacone. And now Lacone, they have really a very serious and very specific uh, selection scheme for meat production with also uh, an improving, they have a big activity on, uh, on uh, sailing rants, so males, okay, for, for reproduction. What about now? Now uh, uh, the production systems in, in Europe. So we can speak here. I uh, I'll take two two representative system. Okay, I'll speak about these two systems. One of them and the most important one most important one is the suckling lambs. So here we can speak about lambs coming from meat breeds origin. Okay, so in these cases we can speak about a lambing and fattening structures, okay, which represents which a, the size of the herd in these cases, it can vary really very, very, very high variations in terms of number of females in each herd. But we can, we can speak about from 300 to 3000 ewes, maybe a little bit more in some situations, maybe a little bit less, depends on the countries. And here we can speak about the specialized structures for meat production, with, the, with using a meat breed, perhaps in pure, perhaps in with a cross with another breed. 
and with two to three landing periods per year. And in the same time, we can speak about uh, landing, for example, a period of landing in September, October, and with a fattening out in, in the bonds, so inside the, the housing. And another period, landing in the bonds, so inside the housing in January and February, plus a fattening outside with, with the grass for, for lambs, for example. Lambs, in the same time, they stay with their mothers, in these cases, almost until the slaughter. So they can go really very, very high uh, uh, with, the, with their mothers. And to finish with that, we can speak here about a, a grassland system where the consumption of concentrate is really a little bit low, okay? If I give you an example about the, the program or the feeding management in this case, in this, in this uh, kind of production. So if we take the, the, the total uh, program from the lambing until the slaughter, okay? So here we can speak about a very long milking feeding period, okay? And the farmers, they, they use uh, a starter feed in general, we use a starter feed in this in, the, in this cases, a starter feed which represents from five to ten kilos per lamb, and followed by a grower finisher feed from fifty to eighty kilos per lamb. So here we can speak. So if we go until thirty-eight or forty kilos of slaughter live weight, here we can speak about a hundred days lamb. Okay. In another way, we have another programs where, for example, farmers, they, they use only for uh, only one feed, okay, uh, from the beginning until the end, a grower finisher feed with a between 60 to 90 kilos of feed of concentrate per lamp, okay? In addition to, to concentrate, we are using straw or hay or pasture, we have all uh, all these systems uh, depending on the on the country. If we take the second the second product production system, so here we speak more about the weaned lamp system. So the weaned lamp mainly coming from dairy origin breeds. In these cases, so we here we are producing milk first of all. So the first objective is the production of milk, cheese production. And with the, the size of the herds in these cases, it varies from, as, as for, uh, for uh, meat breeds, from 300 to 3,000 3, ewes in general. In these cases, the lambs, they stay with their mothers until the, the weaning live weight or until the, until the weaning period. And it can vary from 25, 30 days until 45 days. After that, after the weaning, the, the farmers, they, they sell their lambs and the, 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 the sales, they occurs at weaning for fatteners. So for a specialized fatteners for specialized structures. And we have in general, one period of lambing in, in the year. It, it occurs mainly in October, in the period of October to November. So for the fattening, so we have, we have a specialized fattening structures. We have a big size fatteners or integrators or cooperative, and it can go really until 200,000 lambs in the same site, okay? The fattening finishing mainly from the period of December to May, and here the system, it's really mainly based on the consumption of, of concentrate, okay? of course, with long fibers like hay or like live straw. Some examples of uh, feeding management for this kind of, um, of fattening uh, lamps. So it depends. In general, we can speak about a weaning period in these cases around 12 to 15 kilos of body weight. And we have different different types of slaughter uh, of slaughter live weight or slaughter age, depending on the countries, depending on the market. So, if we speak about Greece and Italy, for example, the slaughter live weight it corresponds to twenty kilos to twenty five kilos of live weight. If we go to Spain and Romania, 
so we can speak about 26 until 30 kilos of body weight. And in France, in general, we slaughter around 30 ki 38 to 40 kilos. So if we speak a little bit about the feeding program. So before weaning, before weaning, so really we can, we can note that in this period, so before weaning, that, that small lambs don't absolutely receive any kind of concentrate. So the, sol the lone solid feed, it's it concerned um, the hay or, or straw with the milk, okay? So that's why really the weaning could be really very brutal and very, and sometimes really very difficult to, to, to manage, okay? When the, the animals or when the small lambs arrive to the, to the fattening house. So after weaning, the first program you can imagine, if we take, for example, the, the small lambs slaughtered at 25 kilos, see, so here we can speak about a 65 days lamb, okay? In general, we use a starter feed for five, four, five kilos per lamb, and then, and then followed by a grower feed from 20 to 25 kilo per lamb. The second program, if we consider the, the market of Spain and Romania, we still am using the same program, but the quantities of feed are a little bit different, okay? And here we speak about a, an 80 days lamb. And for the French market, we can go until if you want uh, 90 or 100 kilos of, of, of concentrate in general between starter and grower. And here we can speak about 100 days lamp. So we have a lot of variation depending on the, on the market, depend, depending on the, on the countries, okay? We arrive at the fundamentals of the uh, of fattening uh, and here I want to show you some fundamentals or some important points uh, going from our experience okay and we can start for example with the, uh, the the one of the fundamentals in my point of view it's that in order really to succeed the the uh, the fattening period we have to, to we have to we need to have a good uh, a good lambs uh, at the beginning okay so a lambs with, without free from disease with a good uh, a good health and so on and so on so the first idea is when we speak about a good start or, or a good quality lamp which is this this criteria is really highly correlated to the success of the milk feeding phases which is really correlated in the same time to the preparations of mothers. So here the idea is when we prepare the mother in order to give a good immunity to the small animals and to get uh, a, a free disease uh, animals uh, ready to be, to be fattened without any problem in the, in the fattening period. So the second, the second criteria, uh, and in my point of view, uh, that we need really to give to the small animals an early distribution of a dry feed, even of a small quantities. And here I'm speaking about a kind of a starter feed in order to have a good preparations of the rumen. So a rumen which is really ca capable to transform the rations in the fattening period without any risk. And at the same time, to smoothly prepare, if you want, the period before and the period before after the weaning. Okay. So we have to keep in mind at the same time that uh, fatteners or or uh, in general they need and they ask us for a rapid fattening period. Okay. And and for us, we have we we need to to work. Uh, on two objectives. We have two goals to do that. So we, we work a lot on the daily, the daily weight gain and the feed conversion ratio. So how we can get really the better efficiency from the, to get, yeah, from the feed and to transform the feed to a daily to growth. From my point of view, one, one, one of the major levels to do that is really the level of energy in the feed. 
And in the same time, we, we, we know in the same time that there is in the, in the period of fattening, there is two important risks. I mean by that health issues and ontotoxemia problems, okay? <clears throat> the second point, and if we continue about the evolution of the daily weight gain and the feed conversion ratio uh, on the period of, um, of the fattening. So in this diagram, we are showing the evolution of the, the, daily, weight, the daily weight gain, the FCR and the feed intake per, per lambs, okay? According to the animal weight, so here in this schemes, we represented from 10 to 40 kilos of body weight, okay? So what we can see here is that before the period of 30 to 35 kilos of body weight, or more precisely from 15 to, to, to 35 kilos of body weight, okay? We can find that there is, it is a period really of a strong daily weight gain and a period of a very good uh, feed transformations, okay? So it's a very benefit to do the maximum growth and the, the more interesting FCR in, the, in this period. So this period is a really very important where we can use or we can optimize, if you want, the genetic potential of the animal and we can qualify it as a period of a greater profit for the farmer and for the fatteners. And, we, and it, is, it, is, uh, it is true for light lamps and it is true at the same time for heavy lamps. And as, as you see, after why I'm, I'm, I'm speaking about the period before and the period after 35 kilos, because after 35 kilos, and as you can see, the, da the daily weight gain is begin to decline and the feed intake and the feed conversion ratio continue to increase. So we can have really we can lose money, we can begin to lose money in, uh, with body weights up to 35, 30, 36 kilos. One of the fundamentals at the same time in the fattening periods uh, is the place is the rumen, okay? We consider that the rumen, we have a, it's a source of a huge information, okay? Only to remind you that the rumen uh, produce energy, as you know, via the circuit of uh, the volatile fatty acids and mainly the propionic acids, so which is still really the most efficient volatile fatty acids we can produce from the rumen. But rumen, in the same time, produces produce waste like carbon dioxide, methane, hydrogen, and, and, and ammonia, okay? So in this cases, and as a nutritionist, and when we formulate when we formulate feed for fattening lambs, our level of actions, one of them is really to use or to employ raw materials with a high digestibility raw materials in order to reduce waste. So this is the first level of action we are using when we formulate feed. The second one is how to optimize the ratio between energy, between starch and fiber, or if you want between propionic to, to acetic acids, or if you want between the efficiency and the security the, in, the, in the rumen, in order really to, to get the best pH regulation in order really to optimize the feed, uh, the, the feed transformations. And the third level is how to manage the microbiota. And in this cases, we focused mainly on the development of coccidia and the clostridium, but mainly in the in the intestine. Okay. I'm still I I still working in the in the in the in the rumen only to show you in the same time that uh, the, the the our our, our job uh, what what we're doing every day is how to optimize really the efficiency while giving to our animals of the energy coming from the rumen. Okay. So, only to remind you that the antibiotic growth promoters, it's really an example, okay? Antibiotic growth promoters, we know that they, they can influence the rumen fermentation profile with acting on gram-positive bacteria, 
with saving the gram-negative bacteria. More precisely, this, this product, they act on acetate, lactate, and methane producers bacteria, okay? And by this way, they favor more the propionic producers bacteria. So we are working with these products, we are working on the, the energy yield coming from the woman. I, I do not advertise, not at all, this kind of product because they are banned already in Europe since 2006, but we appreciate it really a lot, their mode of action and their, and their effectiveness, which we now succeed really in Europe in general to replace them by active ingredients coming from botanical origin, okay? And here, I'm, I'm still uh, focusing on, on the energy, okay? Uh, and here, we, one of the fundamentals of fattening is really the viscous circle of starch. As you know, the starch in, in general in Europe, it's still really the first source of energy, okay? So starch for us, we can speak about cereals in general, okay? Starch, it means for us feed efficiency, okay? Via the circuit of, of propionic mainly. But if we exceed a lot, when we formulate with the high quantities of, of starch in the feed, so there is a limit. We can go to acidosis, we can go to onterotoxemia, to mortality, to economic losses in the same time, okay? And in the same time, we can lose money via a fatty carcass coming from a lot of starch in the feed. So starch leads in the same time to more fatty carcass. So at the end, what we can say about that, so we need starch, but we have to pay attention about how to use the starch and how to secure the, the use of, of starch. So we can speak about the necessary level, okay? And what about the economic weight of the feed conversion ratio in the fattening, the fattening period? Here I'm taking an example of a fattening lambs between 14 to 38 kilos. So 14 at the beginning and the slaughter weight around 38 kilos. So we have 24 kilos to, of gross to do in the fattening and all the period of, of fattening. So on this graph, I, I present the kilo, the number of kilos of feed of concentrate consumed per lambs according to the FCR. What happens exactly from 3.2 to 4.4 of FCR, okay? So in this cases, we can show that, first of all, that between 3.2 and 4.4, the quantity of concentrate per, per, uh, per lamb it varies from 77 kilos until 106 kilos, 106 kilos, okay? So it is really huge. And economically, it is really very huge. So if we take uh, the difference between, uh, it's an example, between the values of 3.6 until and 4.2, for example, okay? In this case, what does it mean exactly? So it means that we need, or the lambs consumes up to 600 grams more feed for one kilo additional growth. So this is economically, it represents four to five euros per lamb. Okay, so it's really very expensive for, for example, for fatteners who owns, for example, 100,000 uh, lambs. So it's really huge, it's really very expensive. So in the same time, if we produce or if we have values, if an FCR value uh, less than 3.6, here we can speak in this period that we are really with a very good value of FCR. And here we can speak about a small proportion of animals, of lambs. We can speak about the best performing animals who represent maybe 10, 15, or 20% of the total herd, okay? But the average we are doing in, in Europe is between 3.6 to, to 4 of FCR, 
Okay, so this is our average performances. And in this, in this um, between these values, we can consider that lamps at the beginning are really in perfect sanitary conditions at the arrivals. And the good we have in a good environmental conditions in the housings. And in these cases, we can, we can speak that the feed is really directly responsible for the FCR, okay? So here's the job of the nutritionist in order to get the better value of FCR uh, for, for the fattening. But if we have values up to four, okay, here we can speak immediately or we can imagine immediately that the feed alone is not enough to explain all the, or the bad values of, of FCR, okay? We can speak more about poor quality lamps at the arrivals uh, associated with health problems, with respiratory disease, with coccidiosis, the digestive disease, the presence of parasites, and so on, and so on, okay? And to finish with the, uh, the fundamentals, here I, I'll show you uh, the feed efficiency, the relationship between the feed efficiency and the, and the performances, okay? And in the same time, on these schemes, on one hand, we can consider that if we, uh, with a good or with a, a feed, if you want, which is rich in fiber and low in, in, in protein, we can get a negative effect on the growth and the transformation of the feed, okay? But on the, on the other hand, and since we are looking for high growth levels and for low FCR, so we have to work with more protein in the feed and more starch in the feed, okay? So in the area, in this area, okay, of, in the graph, we need more starch as a priority, but we have to pay attention about the quality of the starch and we have to to, to secure the use of the starch by using maybe, uh, by balancing the starch with the fibers, with protein and so on and so on. And in the same time, by using maybe a specific additives in order to secure the room and fermentations. At the end, I want to share you with you because the feed is, we have it, the, the, the efficiency, we, we can speak that the, the, the maximum efficiency is coming from the feed. But if we need really to optimize a little bit more the efficiency of the feed, we have to pay attention about the quality of straw or the quality of hay we were, were giving in addition to the feed, okay? So here only to say that uh, if we use, for example, a good quality hay, and I mean by a good quality hay with a high level of starch in the feed, we can really have some uh, it could really become a, a very dangerous situations with the, with a rich feed. Why? Because uh, when you formulate a balanced feed, a complete balanced feed, and we use, for example, hay with a high quality protein and with a high quality, with a high level of sugar, maybe we can get a little bit more complications in the in the barns or in the in the housing or in the fattening in, in general and we can get antibiotoxemia we can we can cause more damage with the a high quality hay than with for example with a straw if we compare it with with a straw but even with a straw the straw it could be really dangerous if the straw is not really consumed correctly or if the straw is a is it for, of a bad quality, okay? And not palatable uh, straw, for example. Okay, so we are going to, to I'm showing to, I, I'll show to, to some, some health concern, the main disease we are, um, we are facing in, in general, uh, only to, to give you an idea about the, the relationship between some uh, health concerns and the performance and the fattening. So from the beginning until the end, so before weaning, we can speak more about weak lamps, about the presence of cryptosporidia, about arthritis, about bloats, for example. And when we go uh, more and more to the fattening period, we have more 
digestive, digestive uh, problems like coccidia, we have a respiratory disease like pastorella, the presence of pastorella, and acidosis, antibiotoxemia uh, at the end part of the, uh, of the fatty. What I want to, to show you here uh, that the only problems of coccidia, so I want to take the example of coccidia, so the only problems of coccidia can have this difference between two twins lambs, okay? So more precisely, the coccidiosis is really, in, in our experience, is, is equal to up to 50 grams less average daily gain, okay? Which represent, in comparison, of course, to a healthy, to a healthy lamp, which represents five for a hundred key for a hundred days fattening lamps, for example, which represents less five kilos at the end. So it is really an economical, an economical losses for the fatteners. It's a huge losses for, for them, okay? So, which explain a delay in the putting on the market, more feed consumed in the same time and higher production cost, of course, okay? So we arrive at the nutrition chapter, and uh, here I want to see and want to show you, show you uh, the composition, the average composition of a fattening feed. What we do in general uh, in in Europe. So it's to get to give you an idea about that. So we consider that uh, in in a formula, in a fattening formula. Okay, so we formulated it around 50 to 60% of cereals. So cereals, and we used mainly barley, corn, wheat, and avena. We formulate a protein uh, around 15 to 60% of protein. And this, this protein they, they are, comes from rapeseed meal, from sunflower seed meal, from soya. For the crude fibers, we work a lot with the beet pulp, wheat brains, and cereals byproduct. And of course, we were putting minerals, buffers, additives, and, and premixes. Uh, here, we, of course, we are in France. And so we work with the French system, uh, French formulation system. Uh, in these graphs, you have the evolutions of energy need for the animals, animals uh, until 40 kilos of body weight. Okay, and we can see that we have a continuous increase of needs of energy until the end, until 40 kilos, okay, with a very high level at the finishing period. If we take the protein, the protein levels, we, we have an increasing level until 35 kilos of body weight and a little bit stable in the, in the finishing. And the ratio between protein and energy is really very high at the beginning and weaker at the end, okay? The energy we are using in the French system is the UFV, which correspond to the net energy for growth, okay? So we, we it's, the net, it's a net energy. And now I will show you in each family of four materials, so I mean by the energy, the protein, and the fibers, uh, raw materials, the some examples about the advantage and disadvantage of the most used raw materials. Okay, so the, if we take, for example, the barley, the barley we use it in a fattening uh, feed formulation, for example, between ten to 50 percent. Okay, so we consider that the barley it's a very good raw materials. It is highly appreciated by lambs. It's a good cereals for, for growth in general, but we have to manage the barley. Uh, maybe we have to balance it with another kinds of, uh, of starch quality or, or cereals. Be, in order really, be, because we know that barley uh, provide a high fermentable starch, so it can cause a risk of acidosis, okay? We employ wheat, in the same time, but with a mineral level, we the maximum level we can use in wheat, it's 15, maybe 20% in some situations. And in these cases, we, we know very well 
that is, we have a higher level of starch in the wheat in comparison to barley. It is more energetic, but in the same time, it is more acidogenic product. So we have a high fermentable starch level in the wheat. But we, we can employ it with a small ratios in the, in the pellets because of the, 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 the good uh, or the positive aspects on the pellet quality. So for more technological aspects, more than the zootechnical aspects. If we, if we speak a little bit about corn, so the corn, we, it's still the reference cereals for the FCR. So we use uh, corn a lot between 10 to 25% uh, percent in, the, in the feed and the concentrate. And we pay attention that a lot of starch coming from corn, we can really damage or we can cause uh, a fatty carcass at the, at the end. The Avena, so it is really very low in energy, but we still employ it from zero until 20%, depending on the situations. It's a very secured cereals, high in fibers, it's positive effect on the carcass quality, but it depends on the situations, okay? We can go from zero, 10, up uh, until 20%, depending on the, the availability of, the, of, uh, of this raw materials. If we speak a little bit about the protein sources, so the protein sources, as I say already, so we work with soybean meal, with rapeseed meal, with sunflower seed meal, and a little bit with the, the wheat brain, okay, which provide a little bit of protein at the same time. But we focused mainly in Europe in general on rapeseed meal, on sunflower seed, seed meal, okay? Uh, the rapeseed meal, we qualified, we have a very good and very interesting amino acid profile. It has the advantage that this is no GMO products, uh, raw materials. Uh, the sunflower, it's a, maybe it's very low in energy, but it's very good fibers to, the, to, to favor the transit, a good transit. And the wheat brain, we can speak about a very good digestible fiber. So it is a very good raw materials to, the, to secure the digestive tract, but it's still really highly variable. So we have to standardize it in the matrix in order really to do a good job, okay? For the fiber sources, so we employ a lot, the beet pulp, we can go from five to 50%. There's no problem, okay? But if we go really very high with the beet pulp, we can get some congestion problems, okay? And we can higher the feed conversion ratio at the same time. But it is still the positive, the positive aspects with the beet pulp, it's still the, the fibers. It's a very good quality fiber, very digestible fiber. And a, we have a very uh, security uh, digestion in the, with, the, with this uh, raw material. The sunflower, of course, for the transit the wheat brain, and a little bit. Uh, we don't like it really very well, but we can employ it from, from zero to 10%, the pelleted alfalfa for the transit, but we pay attention at the same time to not color the, the fat in the, in the carcass. And what about the minerals and additives? So as you can imagine, we can, we, we use the major, uh, the major minerals, okay? The major uh, vitamins, AD3, of course, but at the same time, in my experience, we, we, we use a lot of group B vitamins because we consider them with a major importance on the performance for small lamps, okay? Uh, we, we use in the same times, so minerals, specific minerals, to really to regulate the problems of urealitases, okay? So we, the ammonia chloride, calcium chloride, and some plants, the uretic plants, uh, we use buffers, we use salts, it's in systematic addition in the feed, and additives like antioxidant, like oxidostatic, or chemical, or nature, natural products, in order to secure the digestibility and to boost really the performances. So I, I want to give you an example of a complete program of feed formulations, 
okay, of four, four feed formulations, only to give you an idea about what we're doing in, 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 in Europe in general. From the super start of feed, so the first column, okay, which is the, really the feed we're giving, for example, this one, we're giving for really for small animals, for small lambs, with a very small presentation. So here we're working on with the pellets at around 2.5 to 2.8 millimeters, okay? And this product, maybe we can, we can give it from two to three kilos per animal uh, in order really to boost the consumption of, of solid feed. So here we can, you can see that we employ very specific products like high digestible and appetizing raw materials. We can employ corn sugar, we can employ carrots, uh, and we can really reduce to the maximum non-palatable raw materials, okay? Of course, we use premix editors, flavors, and this kind of product. After that, we can go to the starter feed or the, or the first age feed, the grower one and the finisher one. Okay, so we have a scheme of four, the feed formulation of four, uh, four feeds, uh, potentially we were using in, in fattening lamps. You can see that the major parts of the compositions, if we take, for example, the cereals part or the, the energy, so we use a lot bar barley and corn with the, the same proportion, okay? Uh, and if we have a look uh, to the nutritional uh, aspects of these, of these uh, feeds, okay, only to point that the crude protein, so we formulate at, at the beginning at around 16%, and at the finishing period, we can reduce it until 14, 14.5%. The starch level for all these feeds, and as, as you can see, there is no huge variation between the beginning and the and the finishing uh, and the finishing feed. Okay, so this is really uh, our principle of formulations, in order really to, to 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 not have, if you want, to chuck the rumen and to to put in place in the rumen is a kind of acidosis or to or a kind of antivitoxemia problems. Okay. So I finished with the with the nutritional uh, aspects, and I'm only showing you a, uh, uh, a the 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 the, Euro, the Europe grid grid or the payment grid uh, for the carcass around the carcass quality. So in general, the carcass quality in in general in in Europe and mainly in some countries like France, for example, they paid the carcass. Uh, corresponding to the to the confirmations, okay. Here we have it: the confirmation and the fattening state, okay, or the fat coverage of the of the um, of the carcass, okay. So for the confirmation, we use the Europe grid and the notation uh, from one to five for the fattening conditions, okay. So the highest paying class are the U and R. U and R and the two and three. So this is the most paying classes uh, we can, we paid for the, for the farmers, okay? So if we compare in this situations, I wanna give you an example. If we compare, for example, a 17.5 kilos of carcass to 19.5 kilo with the same classifications. So we are speaking about U3 in this in the both situations, so U3, okay. In the first case, the total price of the carcass it represents 94.5 euros, and in the second one, 105.3 euros, okay. But because we have an extra uh, weight in these cases, so we consumed additional feed. So we have additional feed cost, but in general, we're still in a positive balance at the, at the end, okay? But 
potentially this kind of carcass potentially okay can lead to a worst classifications okay so if we go to a worst classification so if we go to u4 so the payment the total price the payment as a u in euros per kilo we go from 5.4 to 4.1 and the total price it represents only 80 euros for the carcass so the, really the losses as you can see the losses can be really very very high so if we addition the the feed cost and the total penalty or the total losses in comparison to the first situations so we are losing 19 euro per per lamb or per carcass okay so we need really systematically to pay attention about the the extra kilo we are, we are doing we can do and the penalties we can we can have in the same time we arrive today to the production production cost okay and here i i want to show you some example in the cases of a specialized fatteners so i want to take the main factors that influence the profitability okay so the example is a building of 4000 places with a, a start body weight at around 14 kilos and the body weight at the sale, so at slaughter, is around 39 kilos. So we have 25 kilos to produce in the fattening. Okay, so the first situation, uh, I mentioned some, some criterion, for example, the, the purchase price of the lambs in euros per kilo body weight is around 4.5 euros per kilo. We have a mortality around 3%. We have an FCR around 3.7. So it corresponds to a 92.5 kilos per lamb of, of feed, okay? With a feed price at around 276 euros per metric ton of feed, okay? Here you have the total feed consumed and the value of the feed prices. And the end, at the end, we have a sale price at around 2.5 euros of body weight. So in these situations, the gain is around for the total building, okay, is around 27,000 of euro. If we take Another situation. So in the second situations, the, the, the unique difference between the second and the first one is only the purchase price. So we decrease the purchase price from 4.5 to 4 euros per kilo. Okay, so if you can see immediately, automatically, the benefits for the for the fatteners, we double, we can double the uh, the gain we go from 27 to 55,000 euros for for only one building okay in the th in the third situations so it corresponds to the situation two but with the unique difference we increase the fcr from 3.7 to 4.3 okay so in this case because of the penalty or because we are consuming more feeds or more concentrate per, per, per lambs, because we go from 92 kilos to, we have 15 kilos per lamp of difference, okay? This cases, in this cases, we are losing 16,000 euros in comparison to the situation number two, only by the effect of, the, of an, an FCR more important FCR, okay? In the situation number four, we increased only the mortality from 3% to 4.5%. And of course, we lose, we, we continue to lose money, but here in these cases, we lose only 4,000 euros in comparison to the situation number three. And at the end, to finish with that, in these cases, in the situation five, so we consider we are really comparable to the situation number four, but the unique difference, the, 
the sales price, because we increased the sale price from 2.5 to 2.75 euros per kilo of live weight, because the market in this situation, it's really very good. And we have a high demand on the on, on lamb's meat in this situation. And you can see that in this situations, the gain really is, is huge because our gain, the gain is approximately around 45,000 euro in more than the situation in comparison to the situation number number three. Okay, so you, here you have a general scheme on the criteria which influence really the, uh, the, 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 the profitability or the economical balance in, in such situations, in a fattening, fattening, in a specialized fattening situations, okay? So in order to finish my presentation, I'm coming back a little bit about IDENA. Uh, so only to say that we, our experience, we have a 25 years experience in ovine nutrition management. We control or we supervise more than two millions of lamb a year. It's with a, we have a dedicated team of nutritionists and vets for this activity. And as you can see, we, we work uh, with, we have a two main activity. We work in the industrial and the traditional fattening system with sometimes a very complicated health, health context or health issues. We have a, a research partners with engineer school in France, and we have an experimental field station with 4,000 place uh, 4,000 lamps in one housing in order to do tri trials. So, and in general, this activity is a very strategic activity for IDENA and with a recognized know-how. Fatteners, we are really questions about all these different functions. I mean by that, we are, we are questions about performances, we are questions about health issues, and we are, we are questions about economy and profitability. And more and more about how to reduce the use of antibiotics in the fattening period. Okay? I want to thank you. So I have to speak a little bit French. So merci de votre attention. And thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Masoud. Um, I'm going to take back the screen share and do the other, um, my, I'll do my webinar deck. Okay. I have to do a few bits of housekeeping before we start on the, before we start into the question and answers. Um, just to let everyone know, um, make sure that you put your questions in the question window or the chat window. And if, um, and this will get translated, if you um, aren't comfortable in typing it in um, English, go ahead and type it in Turkish or French. We have people who can translate that for me. Um, and then I'll ask the questions. Paula, uh, um, Paula Torillo and John Winchell will also be asking questions um, of the, as we work our way through the question period. So um, just to take care of the few details before we get to those. Um, our next sheep focused webinar, um, I'm going to introduce those and our speaker in the dairy cow focused nutritionist webinar. We have two additional featured webinars this spring focusing on sheep nutrition. Our second webinar is at 8 a.m. in the Eastern or UTC minus four time zone on April 15th, same time as this one, with Dr. Philippe Hassoun from INRA in France. He's going to focus more on milk sheep production. Uh, we will wrap up our sheep feeding webinar series for this spring with um, a webinar hosted by Dr. by John Winchell. I just gave him a promotion. Um, and he's from Alltech. He has been working um, for a long time in our dairy cattle production feeding nutrition software. And he now has been working with small ruminants. He's going to bring together some of the discussions that we're having in these first two webinars and apply them in our program. So this is going to be something very tailored to AMTS users or people who would be interested in trialing the AMTS program. 
our larger, the nutritionist webinar series is focusing on some farm tours, dairy cattle farm tours with the information provided. Our April webinar will provide a considerable climate change from the last two webinars, which were held in snowy, cold North America. We'll be traveling south where Marcelo Hens Ramos, our AMTS distributor in Brazil, will be giving us a tour and insight on Brazilian dairies. Join us to soak up some virtual sun, but I cannot promise that he's going to take us to any of the Brazilian beaches. Email me at webinars at agmodelsystems.com to sign up for any of these webinars. As you know, these webinars take a lot of work and cooperation. The webinars are organized and produced by you, AMTS, USA and Global. Our co-host today are John Winchell, the longtime AMTS user with Dairy Cattle, who's been working most recently in our small ruminant model. Um, we are very pleased to have John join as a co-host in these first two webinars to provide insight from the US sheep side. We're also joined by our distributor in Turkey, Dr. Huday. Kavusturan, he, um, he is helping us with some questions from the Turkish side, as well as our Turkish panelists that we have. Paula Turilo of Afina has been our The Nutrition collaborator since the beginning. She hosts our series as El Webinar del Nutricionista, and she receives support from Rock River Lab in Argentina. She today is delivering this webinar in Spanish on a separate platform for the Argentinian audience. I want to also thank the wonderful group of people associated with Adina who helped get the interpreter feature working. Jean-Philippe Richard of Adina in Turkey, Sergi Yalsinsu and <laughs> interpreter Nahir Guler. We're especially thankful today for these generous sponsors who make it possible for us to get great speakers and manage the program. We thank our gold sponsors, Arm & Hammer Animal Food Production, hashtag science hearted, the canola- Give her some toast, buddy. Give her a uh, slice of toast. Hold on, we need to mute someone. Sorry about that. I think we're okay now. <laughs> The Canola Council of Canada. Learn more about feeding canola at canolamazing.com. Adina, experts in animal nutrition with expertise in plant bioactives and um, directed by our speaker today. And Protetka, transforming the future of farm animal health. Our silver sponsors are Ajinomoto, superior nutrition through amino acids and Virtus, both of whom have sponsored us from the start. Also the forage analysis labs of Dairyland Laboratories and Dairy One, both with affiliates around the world. Adiseo Ruminant Nutrition, solutions to ensure animal performance and micronutrients feeding the future. Our bronze sponsors are Amino Max, Purdue Agribusiness, Origination Inc., Phileo, Balchem, and The Milk Group. Each of these companies support education and research worldwide we hope that you consider them in your formulation decisions. I'm now going to change my slide deck to this view so that we can move to any particular um, slide that um, Masood would like us to, and he's going to instruct me. I'm going to ask everyone now to unmute your mics, um, all of our panelists that want to talk and say hello, and then we'll get started on the questions. Masood, hello, and thank you. Um, Hudai, welcome. Hello, thank you. John, yeah. John, thank you for joining this morning. Thank you, Marian, hello. Hello. Paula, hi. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Hello, hi. thank you very much for this presentation. <laughs> And Thank you. <laughs> so we'll get going on questions. I have quite a few in my chat window that I'll get started with, and then I'll circle over to Sezgi, who's going to be answering or asking questions from the Turkish audience, um, and or she's going to ask me to ask them in in English. 
And then we'll have um, John and Paula ask some questions. So let me see where I can get. I'll start with this one because it's just easy to see. Um, do you use protected amino acids for fattening lambs in Europe? Yeah, yeah. This is this is the question, Marianne. That's it. Yes, it is. I'm sorry, I jumped right in there. <laughs> no, no problem. Uh, no, we we don't use. We we pay attention uh, on the myth, myth, methionine and lysine digestible lysine and digestible methionine, but it is not really a big constraint when we formulate feed for fattening, okay? Okay, th thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna ask, I think, John, do you have any sort of different experience here in the US? Are, are protected amino acids being used? I think on the small ruminant side, they're starting to become utilized more. Um, similar to our counterparts in the large, in the large ruminants, you know, it's been, you know, pretty typical to use. And I think we're starting to look as we work on efficiency a little more, we are looking at that direction a little more, at least I know I am in, in, in my work with it. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. We, we don't have we don't have a a, 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 um, a precise recommendations for for fattening sheep okay in for for amino acids okay this, this is first of all secondly I think that's if we consider for example the amino acids even if we reduce even if we reduce the level of total protein in the feed it's still a little bit uh, expensive I think so Okay, um, while we're on the mm -hmm. subject of protected feeds, um, what about using protected fat for fattening lambs? No, 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 no. For, it's, a, it's my, I'm sharing with you my, my experience. We don't really employ or use protected fat. In my feed formulation, when I formulate, we don't use protected fat. We have some situations in some countries in, in Europe, I can speak about Spain, I can speak a little bit about uh, the UK. So they use one to 2% of protected fat in the finisher feed, okay? But not, not me as, as, a, as a nutritionist, I don't use protected fat, okay? Okay. Um, one more question, and then I'll rotate to one of our other um, um, panelists to ask questions. Um, I noticed that you were, the images you showed were primarily showing feeding of pelleted feed. Uh, do you yep. also, is it, is that primarily what is fed at the points that you're speaking, or is there some um, feeding of of forages, and if so, how influential is sorting in these diets? Um, you, you, you mean you're speaking about the presentation of the feed, that's it? Yeah, is yeah. it all fed as pelleted feeds or are there, um, is there a, a have, grain yeah. or a pellet feed mix in addition to a forage? No, the main, the main part, the main part of, of our market, what we see, it's a mainly pelleted feed, okay? Okay. So with pellets, pellets, uh, between 3.2 to 4 millimeters pellets, okay? But uh, in 100% concentrated feed, but we have in some situations, we can, we can, uh, we can use a complement, what we call a complementary feed. So a 50% complementary feed with cereals, with barley, for example, with barley, a mix of barley and wheat. And in this condition, in this uh, conditions, we can use or a granulated feed or a pelleted feed or a, um, uh, a, a mix, if you want, with the, with a, a whole, a whole cereals or, or a, a, a grinded cereals in the same time. But it is more, we are in more traditional systems. When we go to, to industrial systems, it is mainly a, a pelleted feed. Okay? okay, so the mix between complementary and cereals, it concerns more traditional and the small herds in general. Okay, thank, thank you so much. Okay. 
Um, I'm going to ask Paula if she's ready to ask some of her questions. She says she has a lot. Paula, I can't hear you. Paula? Yes, I'm talking. Very good. Yes? Yes, I can hear you. Um, I'm going to check with okay. one of my attendees I to think, make sure that you can hear. Okay, I think my headset was um, was not working. I will try okay. another one quickly. I can hear her as well. Okay, okay very yes. good. I think our I um, panelists will definitely hear her. I'm just not sure about our attendees. Okay. Much better. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Okay, thank you very much, Masoud. It was a very interesting uh, presentation, and we have many, many questions. <laughs> I, will start, I will start with the first one. Uh, yep. This is from Gloria. Uh, during the first phases of the lamb rearing, 25 to 45 days, uh, and talking about lamb from dairy origin, do they yep. have milk, the ewe? I mean, supplementing the lambs during the time they are not with their mothers, or do they abruptly win the lambs? Look, in the, in the dairy system uh, production lambs, okay, while the lambs, they are with their mothers, they don't receive a lot of solid feed. The, the, the unique solid feed, it concerns only hay or straw. Though, so there is really a very few situations where the, 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 the farmers, they use a kind of starter feed, okay? Because their main job is to produce, is, is to get out the lambs as soon as possible from the farms in order to milk their ewes. That's why they, are, they consider that they will do economy with that, okay? Okay, perfect. Yeah. So they, they don't invest. They don't invest a lot for for small lambs. That's why they don't give really practically anything to these lambs. Maybe a few or small quantities of starter, but it's still really in a few situations. Mm. Okay. okay. Perfect. Yes, and continuing with the with the breeds, uh, I have another question from Patricia. Uh, could you make some comments about the relationship between uh, feed to gain um, on feed to gain ratio? Ratio, you showed a wide range of breeds uh, used in Europe: dairy and meat breeds. Does the breed affects this ratio? Well, of course. Of course. Look, for example, when, when we speak, uh, I, I spoke about the dairy, the dairy uh, values of, uh, of models, okay? Uh, we, we consider, if you want, that the benefits we're doing, we're, we're giving to our small lambs, it depends on the, 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 the dairy values of the, of the mothers, okay? So if they're the mothers, they have already a very good, so they, they have a, a, a big quantity of, of milk, if we can say like that, okay? So the first benefits in the first months or in the period of, of, of suckling or the, the, the milking period, okay? The first benefit, it's, it goes for to the, to, the, to the small lambs, okay? So that's why we insist really in this period to the preparations of the mothers and to a good, feed formulations for the mother in order to get really the maximum milk quantity in order to prepare to have a very good preparations of the small lambs to the fattening period after okay so it is a complete it is a complete program we don't speak only about fattening because the fattening as i mentioned is already highly correlated to the milking period or to the suckling period before the weaning which is highly correlated to the, to, to, the, to the preparations of the mothers and so on and so on. So we can speak about a complete program and not only a small period in the, which concern only the fattening. Everything is, is related here. Everything is correlated. 
Thank okay, you. Perfect. Paula, I'm going to ask you to hold some questions and um, I'm going to now ask, uh, who did I say I was going to ask? Um, <laughs> can we have um, Serzi ask the questions that she has a couple questions in, tur in the Turkish language webinar, yeah. if you would go and then we'll go to John and who die. That's my plan. <laughs> go ahead, Sezgi. Hello, thank you very much. And thank Thomas you. Hutton, so, Marian. Uh, that's a question from Turkey. Mr. Yavuz is asking, what percentage of starch do you use in lamb feeds in the starting and finishing feed for fattening? In short term, short term fattening, sorry. I, I showed I showed that you have the values on the on my last table, okay? Uh, when we need really to perform, yeah, you can get after that, after that, you can, no, after, after, yeah, after that, ah, and the third one, yeah, that's one? it. So okay. As, as, yeah, as you can see, my, uh, my experience, I prefer when we speak, for example, about high level of starch in the, in the fattening period, okay? So we need really to prepare the rumen. So I prefer from the beginning to go with a high level of starch, even in the starter feed. So we formulate around 30 to 35% of starch, even in the starter, in the starter feed. Okay. But we can, we can, we can formulate at 25. It depends what you want to do after. If you need really to, to go to the, to the fattening, could these animals go to the fattening period with a high level of, of energy, so the high level of starch, we need to prepare already the rumen with high level of starch from the beginning in order really to prevent a kind of a, a shock of the rumen when we go to the fattening period with a high level of starch. So it's a kind of preparations in order really to smooth the the, 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 to have its, its smooth preparations of a smooth uh, transition period from the milking until the, the fattening period. Okay. Okay, Sezgi, do, would you like to ask another question or sh um, shall uh, I go? For, for now, I don't have any question. Thank you okay. very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Um, Let's see, who was I going to next? Um, John, John, did you have um, any questions that you wanted to ask? Especially if you have some while we're on this diet page. Yeah, I have, a, I do have quite a bit of questions. Um, uh, and I think it was, it was a great presentation, Masood. And I, I really appreciate the look from the European market on fattening lambs. It, it was really refreshing to see the, the information and the work and, and the really incredible slides that you put into it. Um, going back, I guess, a couple questions. Uh, we were talking about transitioning here. Um, what typically, what percent starch do you see in, in these starting diets and fattening diets? What percentage of starch do you usually like to run in these diets? Yeah, I think it's a very close to the to the last question. I think <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah. It, it may be. Sometimes we're so busy trying to figure out our questions that we miss what you're answering, and I apologize. Yeah. And are the, the 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 protein levels that you had on the slide is that dry matter or as no. fed basis? No, it's in wet as as fed. Okay. okay, thank you. We had questions about that. Yeah. So with the, all, all these values, all these values are the values as fed. Okay. Not, and not on a dry matter basis. Okay. okay. Excellent. With the transition and preparation, you had kind of alluded earlier, obviously trying to, that you don't use a lot of starter feeds and you try to keep them on, yeah. on milk as long as yeah. you can. Do you see any issues with stress levels introducing dry feed close to that weaning time you know in the states we use we probably introduce them to dry feed earlier 
And I wondered if you see or how you guys handle that um, or if you see much stress adding dry feed at around that weaning time. Uh, be, be sure that uh, that we we uh, we advise systematically systematically to uh, the farmers really to use a kind of starter feed before the weeding. Okay, one of the major problem we have is when the the the, the lambs uh, and mainly in the dairy in the dairy sheep uh, production system when the lambs goes from from the, the lambing uh, sites to the fattening sites, okay? Even if the lambs doesn't consume a lot of feed before. So we have a lot of problems in this period around the weaning when the lambs, they arrive at from zero concentrate to 100% concentrate. We have a lot of problems around that, okay? So we try a lot to say to the farmers to the, in, the, in, the, in the lambing house, to, to put at least one to two kilos of starter feed per lambs in order really to begin the, the, the fermentation in the rumen and to prepare, to have a better preparation of the, of the rumen. But for, for, for simplicity reasons, for economical reasons, the farmers, they don't do that, okay? And that makes, that makes sense. And that's a struggle that I think everybody, no matter what country you are in, we yeah. run into that 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 issue, um, of course. Yeah, uh, a so. question about stress too. How is coccidiosis controlled in the EU market? Um, obviously, there's different ways that are, it's controlled here in North America. But I guess I'm just curious what you have seen that's been pretty successful to reduce coccidia. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, we, in uh, in Europe in general, we developed today. We are really inc increasing. We are going really fastly to the to the non-use of antibiotics or chemicals in, in in the feed, or in general in general in, in using this kind of product in the in the farms. Okay, but we're still using, for example, toltrazuril. Okay, the Baycox. We're still using Vecoxan, but the volumes are really highly in, in, in decreasing this, this kind of product. And we are really, and it's not really commercial what, I'm, what I want to say, we are really um, moving fastly to alternative product. So we put, we, we, we secure a lot, uh, our feeds in, in bioactives, which have really a very good activity on parasites in general. Okay, we we don't have we don't have for the moment a hundred percent efficacy on that, but maybe in, maybe in one to two to two years we will get maybe hundred percent efficiency. Believe me, in in industrial systems we used more because we don't need because we have a big structures a big numbers of animals so we don't want to touch the animals because it, it is a a very very it's a, it, it the, in terms of labels we have it's a very good very expensive so we put coccidiostatic in the feed we so we manage that or via uh, products or active ingredients or products like sulfamide, sulfamides, that's it, or, or plant extract in the same time. It depends on the situations. Yeah, and that makes sense. I mean, we've seen so much on the essential oil and botanical market and, and that how that market is exploding. And I would assume it's, it's the same in the EU. Okay. Yeah, as um, I said, that, okay. No, no, go ahead, please. Yeah. No, no. I, I want to explain that uh, it depends. It depends on the on the system. Today, when we speak about uh, suckling uh, suckling lambs or more traditional systems, where everything or where lambs are still in the same site, okay, where the lambing and the fattening occurs in the same site, believe me, we don't have any problem to replace chemicals by bioactive with 100% successful results, okay? The problems, it's still in the fattening in the more industrial systems 
when we put, for example, in the same housing, a multiple origin. So when, when we put, for example, 4,000 uh, lamps in the same houses, so we can have maybe 20 or 30 different origin. So here we have a mix of the sanitary issues, which could be really explosive, you know? In these situations, we need chemicals from time to time. We don't have 100% succeed. You understand? Yes, that makes 100% sense. That, that, that is one of the hardest issues that we run into, I think, in the industry. So That's it. Exactly. Exactly. You said most of your diets are hay or straw. Are there any farms that are utilizing wet forage or, or silage for fattening lambs in the no. EU? No wet, no wet forages for, for lambs or for fattening in general in Europe. Okay. okay. All right. And what percent roughage do you usually like to run in some of these diets to just to keep the rumen regulated? We, we prefer, we prefer uh, straw to hay, first of all, and the percentage of, of uh, straw for the total uh, intake, for example, it represents 10 to, to 15 percent. Yep, makes, makes 100 percent sense. Yep. All right. Thank you, John. I'm going to cut you off briefly. Yeah. So um, we'll cycle around to you after a couple more questions. I have a question that um, I'm going to ask, and then we'll go to see if Hudai has any questions. And then I know we have some um, Turkish questions. I need to get a couple out of the way. Um, while you're talking about um, that your level of forage and diets, how do you suggest keeping under control lactic acid bacteria and, and Ontario to semi, I said that all wrong in feeding a highly <laughs> fermentable diet. Yeah. Enterotoxemia, right? Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand. Uh, we, we, we control, I, as I mentioned in one, one of my table, maybe in the, in the, in the slides, uh, number three, no, number 30, it should be okay. before, before this one. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah, that's it. So we use, uh, Marianne, we use systematically, systematically buffers, systematically, I mean, in the fattening regime. Okay. okay. When we formulate. In the same time, we developed, uh, bioactive ingredients, bioactive complexes in order to manage less acid, less uh, lactate and more propionate, okay? We have a huge number of results, scientific results around that. And we do that by plants. That's why I mentioned plants in, in my presentations, okay? Mm -hmm. But we still mix chemical buffers, sodium bicarbonate, with bioactive ingredients, with plant extract at the same time, okay? Okay, perfect, thank you so much. Um, I was looking for a related question, but while I look for that, um, I do have a question that has been hanging out there for a bit. When you said the live weight gain of 600 grams per day, is that, um, that must be specific to a certain breed, I'm guessing? Um, because for some some sheep that might be a very high body weight gain. What are your no. thoughts or comments? I, I didn't speak about about uh, six hundred days of a daily weight gain. You mean that's it? Um, I believe so. Um, six hundred no. grams per day. No, no. When I speak, when I spoke about the six hundred grams a day, it was the the um, the, the extra feed. The, the lambs are consumed in order to, to, to do one kilos of growth per day. So we are speaking about the feed conversion ratio. That's it. Okay. The difference. So you can go maybe before, if, you, if really to explain the point correctly. Before, before that, before that. No, that's it. That's it. Maybe uh, tw the 21, the 21. Okay. Thanks. There yeah. we go. Yeah, that's it. The 21. There. Yeah. That's it, Mayan. When you yes. speak about Plus, yeah, only I, I, was exp I was explaining that the, the difference between 3.6 to 
okay, as the values of the, the FCR. So the difference between both, both values, it corresponds, okay, to a 600 grams of feed per kilo of growth. So the animal from 3.6 until 4.2, the lambs need 600 grams more feed in order to do one kilo of growth. Okay, so which represent for the total fattening period around four to five euros per lamp. Okay, only to show the difference between more competitive and less competitive values of feed conversion ratio according to a, a economical balance at the end. Okay. You understand? Thank you. Thank you. The, 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 I apologize. There are so many no questions problem, no problem. <laughs> and I'm trying to keep them sort of aggregated. No Going problem. back to the diet slide, um, in regards to B vitamins, um, John, you found it. No, this is the economical, the production. Oh, so sorry. Yep. You're right. I need to go quite a bit further. I based it on, I did a quick scroll. Is this, That's it. this one? Yeah. The third one. Yes. All right, the B vitamins. <laughs> Where was that question? Yeah, there was a question basically that said, Marianne, that was it was asking if you were using rumen protected B vitamins or unprotected B vitamins in your formulations. Yeah, <laughs> it says first of all, this is not a protected form. Okay, mm -hmm. but with the, we we employ a high level. Uh, B vitamins in the, in the feed, okay? But it is not really protected, okay? Okay. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, John. I really need help from my friends. Um, uh, Hudai, would you, do you have any questions that you would like to ask? Yeah, I would like to say a couple of things. <clears throat> thank First you. First of all, I would like to thank you for this really great presentation. So, you know, I'm calling from Turkey and Turkey is, uh, has around more than 40 million use yep. for all sheep population. I think 75% of total Europe now. That's it, exactly. Yeah. So there is a huge opportunity for the sheep raising, sheep farming here in Turkey. Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I introduced the first feed for the uh, lambs first time in it was 1988 so uh, we early weaned the lambs and we got really unbelievable results from our uh, native breeds it is a very tiny tin tail ship it's very popular in turkey we call it as a kurjik yeah so the result was extremely good uh, the average body weight at the end of four months of age uh, was about uh, 52 kilograms. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't believe in eyes when we got the, the result. So the, my question is that, uh, do you have any special procedure for weaning the lambs? How do you wean the lambs? How do you adapt to the concentrate for the fattening? Yeah. It's a very uh, general, general question, but uh, we, there, there is different different way to wean if you want. Okay, uh, for me, the weaning the weaning date, or the weaning age, if you want, or the weaning live weight, it depends. It depends first of all that what what you want to do with your lamps. Okay, if you are in a dairy breeds or if you are in in a meat breeds. Okay. The weaning, for me, it depends first of all on the daily value of the mothers. So the quantities of milk uh, given by the mothers, okay, produced by the mothers, by the youth, okay. So even if you don't have, if you if you imagine or we can assume that the quantity of milk is not really highly sufficient in order to wean or order to nourish, for example, one lambs, so you have to wean as soon as possible. For me, 
I, in these cases, I don't really look to, to push or to boost the production if genetically, to put the, the milk production, I mean, if genetically the ewes don't produce or don't have the possibility to produce a lot of milk. So I prefer in these cases to manage the lamb with distributing a starter feed, a palatable feed as soon as possible in order to wean, wean it as soon as possible, okay? And to get really the better benefits from this period, which is a very good period in terms of growth in the lambs in order really to gain time, okay? In the same time, if you consider that your dairy, your dairy sheep or your, your, your ewes are potentially very good in, in terms of milk production, we can maybe manage the system with a weaning live weight or weaning period a little bit more uh, extended in the, in the time, if you want, okay? So it depends a lot uh, about what you are giving to your use about the, 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 the daily values of your use, the production, the milk production of the use, and so on and so on. The quality of your forages you are giving to your use, if there is really high and good values to produce milk with the forages or with the raw materials or with the rations in general you are giving to the, to, 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 to the mothers, okay? So it's a, it's a, there is no only one, one thing in which we can, we can think. It is a multiple factors and we have to manage that depending on the situations. Okay, Paula. Okay, go thank ahead. you very much. Or I'm sorry, uh, Hudai, do you have more questions? Not at the moment. <laughs> okay, all right, perfect. I promised Paula I would let her ask about four questions because she has many. And then we'll come back to another, um, either questions in my chat window or questions um, from Sersky. Go ahead. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Uh, this question is from Gloria. Uh, which is the proportion of artificial rearing of lambs? Uh, artificial? Winning af artificial? Rearing. Uh, winning after colostrum feeding. Uh, like I mean in dairy calves. I you know what I mean? No, I don't really understand the question. Um, feeding a replacer, a milk replacer, ah, rather okay. than um, yeah. artificial. Artificial yes. milk replacer. Okay, I oh, okay, I understand. What do, what do you mean? What what the proportion? That's it. Oh, yes, which is the proportion of artificial rearing of lambs in yeah. sheep dairies? In those cases, when do they start feeding starter? If they do, uh, look, in, the, in, in general, in general, when we have a prolific, a prolific breeds, okay, in general, the farmers they keep one, one lambs with their mothers, okay, uh, one to two maybe with a very small, with a very few uh, situations. So, but the other lambs. So, if we consider one lambs with one, with one use or with one mother, so all the other lambs. Of an artificial artificial uh, milking system, okay. Now, say if we, I I don't have really any idea if we can speak about the proportion. It could be really very highly variable, highly variable. Really, believe me, I don't have a a, a number in my mind, really, okay. Okay, and but, uh, when do they start feeding starter? In, in all the farms, we can see the milk replacers that farmers they do and they use milk replacers but i don't have any idea about the proportion which which represents okay okay perfect um, when feeding concentrates in precocious breeds how do you manage the feeding to reach the slaughter weight with no excess fat yeah, it depends on the breed. It depends on the period and the, the length of the fattening period. It depends on the feed formulations. If you don't want to take a risk, this is one, one of the simple rules or simple advisors I can do, I can give to you. If you don't want to take any risk about the quality of the fat or, the or a maximum fat in the carcass, 
So you can use, for example, a more secure feed, like a feed, for example, formulated at 10, 12% of crude fibers with 25% of starch, with maybe 16% of protein, with less energy in general, okay? So we are favoring more fibrous energy than starch energy, okay? So the feed formulation can really completely change in these conditions. But at the same time, in these conditions, we can gain on the quality, on the carcass quality, but we can lose on the feed conversion ratio. Okay, perfect. But, yes. but keep in mind yes. that we can do everything. So we can do a customized program depending on the, on the situations, on the problems. We have a lot of, of problems around the, the, the carcass quality, if you want, a lot of problems, okay? But we manage even, we manage a specific programs depending on the situations, okay? Okay, perfect. Uh, there is a, a question about uh, management from Eduardo. Can you make some comments about sharing before fattening and its effects on weight gain and feed to gain ratio? Okay, can you ask again, please, the question? To sharing? Yes. What do we mean? Sharing the lambs before going to the fattening period. Yeah. And, and how does it affect the weight gain and the fit to gain ratio? Before or after, you mean? Bef before, sharing before the fattening period. Yeah, if you want, yeah. If, if you can, yeah, in, in these two phases, if we consider that before weaning and, and after weaning, okay? Be before weaning, if you want, if we wean, for example, around 45 days, if we take this, this uh, weaning date, uh, as a rule, if you want, okay? We, we consider that in this period, we don't have, at, at, in this period, okay, before, we don't have a lot of, of uh, concentrated feed, which is consumed, if you want, okay? So, of course, that our animals, because they represent in the same time a high potential growth with a good feed efficiency, the feed conversion ratio in this period, it is really obligatory, if you want. It's re really very good. Okay, look, look, to, look to my scheme. Uh, uh, Mariana, please, you can go to my... Um, which slide? I presented already. Yeah, something was in... in uh, go, 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 and go ahead. Yeah, that's it, that's it. The 18, 18, number okay. 18, please. Okay, so look, look to this scheme. If we consider, for example, that your weaning, your weaning body weight is yeah. around 15 or 20 kilos, okay? Look to the curve of the daily weight gain and the feed conversion ratio. And as I mentioned, that in this period, when we have really, when we still have young animals, we are at the top period in order really to favor the daily weight gain and we have in the, the top period to do a very good feed conversion ratio. What we call, what, what, I, what I call it, the, it's a great profit period. But if you weaned or when you go, for example, after the weaning and we go to the 100% concentrated feed system, the, the, we are completely in two, in two, uh, two different organization, if you want, okay? And, and in the fattening, if we go in the fattening, I, I, uh, it is more simple to calculate in this period a feed conversion ratio because you, you know already what you are giving because the system, it, it represents 100% concentrate, okay? And in these cases, as, as I said already, that in, in the fattening period, the feed conversion ratio, it is directly correlated. I agree with that to the feed formulations, but it depends in the same times on the quality of lambs at the beginning of the, of the fattening. So if you arrive in the, in the housing, in the fattening houses with a very bad quality lambs, 
or, or lamps with coccidia or lamps with sanitary problems or with respiratory problem, problems. So you, your feed, it is not really sufficient to do a very good level or a very good level values of feed conversion ratio. You understand? Um, I, yeah, Masood is, are these sheep ever, is their wool ever removed? Is it ever sheared? I think that's a part of Paula's question as well. And if so, how does that affect these factors? The, the, you mean the, the health concern, you mean? Yeah, do they ever um, remove the wool in, from, from these, these lambs that are used for fattening or do they never shear them? No, Mayan, the, the, what, what, I, what I'm speaking about that when you, when you have sanitary issues in fattening period, so we have to regulate them. So genetically or the, uh, the, the, the health of, of the animal because it suffers from something, from digestive issues or from respiratory issues, your, your feed, the animal doesn't really transform your feed at the top. So we are losing some values about the transformations, okay? So we need in this case to regulate sanitary issues before to think about the feed conversion ratio. Okay, all right. Okay. I I think that I'm I'm perhaps not understanding um, both Paula's question and and perhaps your answer because I think what she's asking and we do have um, one of our panelists is saying they have good experience in um, hot and humid summer days they shear yep. the sheep and that yep. improves the rate of growth um, and that I think was what Paula was asking because she's in Argentina and this could also yep. be a factor. Yeah, this is yeah. This is another another problem. We are speaking about environmental conditions. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And here we can via the formulation environmental conditions, so we can speak more about heat stress, like in dairy, for example, and we can include in the feed some and more specific ingredients to in order really to keep the animals with a bit, with a better appetite in order really to to boost the and not to lose about the in the feed intake per day in order really to maintain a very good level of of intake a very good level of of her, for her performances in the same time okay okay so we can manage another kind of of feed formulations for this kind of street of uh, of heat stress okay thanks paula okay. do you have um, more questions? Yes, my, my last four, uh, my last question uh, in these four is uh, about um, management also, management practices. Um, do the lambs enter the balance for fattening with their tail cut? Uh, uh, and are there some protocols uh, on animal welfare you have to follow on facilities and practices? The, 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 the cut of the tail, it occurs already uh, in the 10, 10 first days of age. So before the, the lambs arrive to the fattening houses, bones. Okay? So... Perfect. We, yeah. We don't have for the moment uh, another technology uh, to, for, to, cut the, to cut the tails uh, after, after this period. Okay? Everything happens... 10 days in the, the first 10 days of, of age, okay? Okay, thank you, Paula. Hey. Um, I'm gonna circle around to um, some of the other um, panelists. I know that um, Sezki has some questions from the, the um, Turkish audience who die also will help us with those who die. You, um, I'll, I'll start with you and then go to Sezki. Yeah, okay, one of the uh, attendees from Turkey is asking uh, if the numbers uh, on your the slide number is 21 represent the values as a and TMR or concentrate. This one? I don't know. He gave the numbers 21. 21, that's it. That's one. Yeah, it was. So this one, no, I'm this speaking here. 31. 
It's the quantity of cons Let me check it again. What his question was? No, oh, sorry, 31. 31, yeah, 31. that's one. Okay, excuse me. Yeah, so the question yeah. is? The numbers are the, the values in the uh, TMR, total mix ratio values, or uh, just concentrate? Only concentrate. Only concentrate, yeah. okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So this is the feed feed recommendation for, for feed formulations, but for concentrate. Okay. Okay, and, and while we're on this particular slide, I'm not sure I'm interpreting the question correctly, but the LISD, is, is it an RM, and I don't know what RM is, or grams per kilograms? Protected. Wait, RM, well, I mean by that, raw materials, something like that. Okay, okay, mm -hmm. rumen protected, rumen protected? Is that possibly? No. That was a no. guess from Wait, in, which, in which slide? In which <clears throat> slide? This slide um, on the, the diet. Ah, appetizing raw materials. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank okay. you so much. <laughs> uh, go, go ahead. Sorry, I butted in um, um, Hudai or Sesgi. No, thank you. Hello. I have Hello. two questions <laughs> from thank Turkey. You. Yeah, yes, go ahead. ahead. Hmm. Uh, one of them is, uh, how does it affect to improvement of animals in fattening by starting with feeds with 20% protein, but with low starch at the beginning, and then using high starch, low protein feed? How does it affect to improvement of animals in fattening, like this diet? I, I I will ask you to really to repeat the question by, because I didn't completely understand it. Please. Okay. In fattening, uh, by starting with yeah. feeds with twenty yeah. percent protein content. Twenty percent. Twenty percent yes, protein. Yes, protein, but with yeah. low starch at the beginning. Yeah. Diet. Then yeah. using high starch with low protein content. Yeah. Yeah. How does it affect the improvement of animals? Oh, okay. Yeah. Or fattening. <laughs> Look, I, I I didn't never formulate uh, in 30, 30 years <laughs> of, uh, of of job of business of nutritionist uh, for for sheep is a twenty percent of protein even for the start of period of fattening. Uh, for me, it's a huge. It's really a lot. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think my my interpretation or my analysis for for that, if you if you uh, if, you, la ropa, la ropa. if you create a, a lot of variation between the beginning and the end, while well, you a las you are Juan y, y tre, y so you are you are managing continuously the a variation in the room and fermentation. So between twenty percent of protein at the beginning. And imagine 25% of starch. And at the end, you can inverse this proportion to the profit of starch. Imagine the rumen, what we can, what we are, what we are causing to, to the rumen fermentation. For me, you are not really at the top. Look, the what I what I'm giving here, if we consider, for example, the evolution of the starch level and the protein level from the beginning until the end. On the on your on the table on the right of of of, uh, of this paper, okay. So the variation between the beginning and the end it's really very very low, and we do that in order really to get the better uh, homogeneity in the in in room and fermentation, and not to vary a lot between the beginning and the end. We can vary mainly on the quality and the choice of the raw materials but the nutrients level still approximately the same. Mm -hmm. Okay? And in order to be complete, to be fully, uh, to explain completely the idea, uh, maybe in 10, 15, or 20 years ago, we used in the, in the fattening period two to three f feed, different feeds, okay? And as you know, between two feeds, we have to do a few, some, few days of transitions. And in order to economize, 
and not to disturb the Roman function, today we can do, and we are doing more and more with only one feed from the beginning until the end. You understand okay. the idea? All right. I think yes. For okay. me, it's okay, yeah. but for the question. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask a couple questions. Um, one of them is is um, from one of our attendees who's in Wales. He says that um, in in UK they're seeing some supermarkets asking producers not to use soya in their diets um, for sustainability purposes. Is this true in the rest of the EU and other countries? We have the same, the same kind of constraint uh, more and more constraint about that. Yeah. I think um, we probably all can look forward to that. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> we, 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 have, we have a lot of constraints really in Europe in general. Even, for example, you, you spoke about flavors. So every, every kind of synthetic products, even if it is really fla flavors, you know. We spoke to, about, for example, why we don't employ protected fat. I want to be clear. We don't employ protected fat because it comes from... Uh, it's not sustainable, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that, that, that's why we they, they, we have a, some uh, production rules, uh, certified uh, productions in, in, in Europe, mainly in France, in Italy, in, in Germany, which really banned completely synthetic and non-sustainable products, even if it is really vegetable products, you know? Yes. Yes. Um, and I think that that is something that as, as livestock nutritionists will have to understand of course. more and more, um, exactly. especially as competition with um, lab grown meat yeah. and other, other sources of protein becomes more and more a question of, of the environmental impact. So, yes. Um, I have a question um, that was well in the early of the presentation. What about wet beet pulp and urea mixture? What about, excuse me, Mayan, wet? Yes, how, how, what are your comments or thoughts on that? Uh, Mayan, please, I, I don't understand the question. Yeah, I don't either. Uh, <laughs> let me see if I can find the reference. Yeah. Maybe, maybe my questioner is- No, 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 go, 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 go for it. Uh, yeah. Let me let me look for it. Um, my goodness, it was Red way, beet way pulp early. and urea mixture. The sheep pork and urea. Yeah, wet beet pulp and urea mixture. Ah. Uh, for fattening, if we speak really fattening, we don't use not at all urea and feed formulation. Not at all. Um, why, uh, this is an ignorant person asking me, um, why is that? Why? Because I, I think that uh, even if we, we, we can, we, we don't use it because farmers, they don't want that, because fat owners, they don't want that, because uh, as we said already, that the, the, the market, they don't want chemical products and so on and so on. But technically or zootechnically or nutritionally, we can do that. No problems. So if we add one percent of urea, for me, that, there's no problem. Even if we had a lot of a lot of starch in the in the in the feed. So technically, there is there is no reason to 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 ban urea from the feed, feed formulation. But we respect the the demand of of the market, of the fatteners, so on, of the consumers. Mm -hmm. and, okay. Okay. Yes, and that's ultimately what what sometimes drives these decisions. Um, how in, does in it- situations, In some situations, in some yes. situations, we don't, we don't have the possibility to use fermented, I mean, fermented forages, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we can speak about corn silage and we have some sectors and some production systems 
they banned the fermented forages from their from the the feed formulations for lambs. You know. Um, so I'm, I'm familiar <laughs> with that specifically yeah. in cheese production. Is um, it also translates over into lamb production? And specifically, you you know, for lambs in general, we look uh, we look first to the to to simplify the system to the farmers, you know. Mm -hmm. So we look really to the most simple way to nourish the fattening lambs, this category of animals. Okay, um, thank you so much. A question about the degradability of starch sources and how that affects body weight gain. gain. Yeah. Um, I don't have, I have a very good slides for that, but I don't, I don't. Oh, you didn't, my you didn't include it in this deck. Okay. No, no problem, but I, I will answer you. Uh, so we, we use independently of the, of the starch or the cereals we're putting in the, in the pellets. Uh, we have a, a lot of um, systems based mainly on the cereals produced in the farms. Okay. Uh, so in this cases, we we employ a lot and we 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 advise mainly the rolled form of cereals okay but in some situations the farmers they employ the whole grain so as it okay if we speak for example about the barley mainly barley it, which represent the main the main parts of cereals of this kind of of, uh, of system okay between rolled barley and whole barley, so we can lose a lot at the end on the feed conversion ratio, on the quantity of feed, of total feed consumed per animal, per lambs, okay? For the same body weight at the end. Why? Because the rolled feed, the rolled uh, cereals or the rolled barley, it is more, it's still more digestible, more efficient, then the whole grain, okay? And the whole grain we can find from 10 to 20% in the feces, which means that it is more bypass starch and it is more bye-bye starch, if you want. So we can lose it. So it is a loss of energy. And that's why we can lose about the, if the feed efficiency at the end between two forms or two cereals presentations in the feed. Uh, thank you. Um, question on your barley. Is there a whole barley do, is there a crimping or a rolling mechanism that would increase that digestibility and less bypass? Uh, if we speak about the whole barley, there, there is no mechanism for me. There is no mechanism today. If we give it as fed to the, to the animals as whole, whole grains, so the barley really, we, we are not at the optimum in terms of digestibility of the grain. Okay. So if you okay. need really, if you need really to process the barley, or you can you can put it in a rolled form or in a grinded form, finally, or a gross, gross uh, um, uh, grills uh, rolled, rolled or grinded, or maybe in flower forms. But the, the, the most interesting and the most secured form when we process barley, I prefer mainly the rolled form, okay? I'm, this is the main uh, presentation we advise to the farmers, okay? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm so sorry, I'm, I'm asking a lot of questions and I need to give no time problem. to the other people. I have two management type questions that I'm going to ask. And then I'm going to have Sezgi ask, um, she has a question that she wants to ask. And then I know Paula has a bunch. Um, so thank you so much for, for hanging in there with us. Um, so my questions are, one is, do you have any special tips during the flushing period of the U for nutrition? <laughs> yeah, of, yeah, of course. Uh, the flushing, the flushing for for better reproduction. You mean for better polyphysity, something like that? 
Um, I, I, that's all the information I have, but um, perhaps the person who asked the question will answer quickly. And it's in um, Turkish in the question window. So if you can read that, which you can go yeah. ahead and see if that elaborates. Yeah, but yeah, only, only to answer uh, you, uh, Marianne, when, what, I, what I understand by flushing and what do we practice around that is around the reproduction period. Okay, so mm -hmm. we, 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 we try to manage differently uh, something like uh, in order really to facilitate the, the arguments 30, day, 30 days before and 30 days after the inseminations, we can practice a kind of flushing and we, we try to manage differently the level of energy, the level of, I, I speak about for, for you, that's it. Uh, uh, we try to manage differently the levels of vitamins, trace minerals, and, and macro minerals in, in, in general, in, in this period mainly, in order really to get to work on the, a little bit on the prolificity and on the maintenance of the, um, of the embryo, you know? Okay, Th thank you. Um, the question, the other question I wanted to ask um, and Seski can chat to me whether she wants to go next or if I should go to Paula because she does have some welfare um, management type questions that follow up on this. Um, besides vaccination, how do you um, work to prevent pastoralosis in these um, high density systems? This is, it's not really my job directly, okay? But- okay. If, if, if I can give you some, uh, some uh, of my experience about that, <clears throat> what happens a lot, so, so we vaccinate the mothers against, against the pastorella. So via the mothers, from time to time, we vaccinate the lambs around 60 to 65, uh, or maybe from 50 to 60 days of, of age for pastorella. The second vaccine we can we can use, but it is really not common. It's a vaccinations against the Clostridia, Antibiotoxinia. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Paula. Do you want to ask some questions? And I muted you a while ago, Paula. So you're going to. Yes, I'm here. Yes, okay. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't find the, the bottom. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, which is which are the parameters uh, you can share with us to get a purchase price of four or four point five euros? What can I advise? You mean that's it? Yes. <laughs> or what do you look to get uh, uh, one or, or the other? It doesn't depend on me, Paula, but because it's the price, the market price, you know. Uh, I was giving an example in general, what happens, for example, when the fatteners purchase the small lambs, okay? So it depends on the year, it depends on the market. And this price can vary really from maybe from four euros to five euros until maybe 5.5 euros. It depends on the season, believe me. And even for the sale market at the end, at the, the slaughter age, okay, it can vary really very high. We can, we can get a very high variations for the sale prices in the same time. So it doesn't depend on me, it depends on the market price. Okay, it's clear. And I, I had a question about the, the welfare, animal welfare protocols. Do yep. you have to follow some protocols uh, on management and facilities? Yeah, uh, we have some indicators, of course. Look, I, I want to give you an example, and you will understand, I hope, that I have a fattener, okay, a client. I follow him maybe from 25 years ago, and uh, this fattener, uh, maybe in 20 years, 25 years, uh, he, he owned and he fattened 
until 150,000 lamps a year, okay? Today, he fattened only 1,000, only 1,000 lamps in the same surfaces of housing, the number of square meters of, of places. What does it mean? It means exactly that. He lose 50,000 lambs for the benefit of the welfare of animals. So he goes from three lambs per square meter, and now he is around two, two lambs per square meter. You understand? Yes, perfect. so perfectly if, clear. If we, were, if we want to consider the welfare, in general, what, what, what does it mean, the welfare? First of all, as a nutritionist, I can say that the first criteria of welfare is a good balanced, uh, uh, balanced rations, which correspond to the need of the animals, okay? Secondly, we can sp speak about the, 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 environment, the environment of the animal, first of all, how much square meter I am doing with my animals, okay? So to work to the, on the comfortable, on comfortable parameters, like the surfaces, like the air volumes, like, and so on, and so on, okay? Yes, perfect. If you want, if you want, we have some, some indicators about that. If you want really to just, to, to exchange, together about that, we yes. can do that maybe after the webinar by mail or something like that. There is no problem. Yes, that would be great for us, yes. No problem. Thank you. No. May I make another question, Marianne? Yes, Paula, go ahead. And then I'm going to ask Hudai has, um, I'm gonna ask Hudai if he can, if, if it's necessary or if he needs to translate some of the questions that have been in the chat. Um, I know that okay. he can do that for us. So go ahead, Paula. Okay, yes. Uh, do you systematically add ammonium chloride to finishing diets in general, or do you separate lambs by gender and just feed it to the males? <laughs> Very good question. We have, the, we have both situations, okay? If we have male and female in the same housing, so we are obliged to put, to put it for, for everyone, Okay, but if we have the possibility and we have the sufficient number of animals in order to separate male and females, so we do that only for males. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Uh, do you feed hay separated or mixed with the ration? If say no. if if it is separate, if separate. it is it limit fed? If, if it limits, limits fat or that's it, the question? Yes. Yeah. So first we put it separately. Okay. And yes, it could be a good thing to limit uh, fat in the, in the carcass. But in one conditions, you have to, to go until 25 or 30% of, of hay from the total intake okay so the hay uh, must represent a good proportion in order to dilute the energy in the feed okay yes you understand the idea? okay yes yes okay yes, paula um are you maria i have just one more Go. And I will have to leave in 10 minutes. And I think okay. Paula is pretty <laughs> tired also. But uh, may I, I do it? Yes, May please. I ask? Please. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, the question is, are lambing and, and the suckling period in barns or outside? If they are outside, which are their recommendations on management mainly? Recommendation about what? Ma management. Management of what? Uh, I don't know. 
I think you uh, have uh, different environmental conditions according to the season. Uh, no, it, it depends when, yeah, when we have the, we have both systems, if you want. Okay. Uh, when they use lamps outside. Okay. First of all, please, we need to pay attention about the climatic conditions. Okay. Because if they, for example, if they lamps outside with a very cold conditions or climatic conditions, it could be really very hard to the, for the small lamps, okay? Um, this is the first criteria that's really where, we, where I can insist ab about. I don't have a direct recommendations when the lamps or when they use lamps outside. It's really, we have only to pay attention about the climatic conditions in order really to preserve the, the health of the, of the small lamps. And, and, and that's all. After that, it depends on which which types of of, of housing do you have, or I, I prefer in general really that the lambing, even if we are in in spring or in in summer summer days, I prefer that the lambing period, even for a small periods, that we put really the the use inside the housing. Okay, we will catch we'll get more benefits because we have a better control of the, of the landing around the females if we put them inside. After maybe after a few days, we can, we can, uh, we can, uh, we can put them outside, no problem. But maybe for one week or for 10 days, we can manage the landing period inside the bar, okay? Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Paula, thank you so much for joining us. I know you need to leave. Hudai, um, did you have some questions that you did not feel directly or and you would like to um, speak of them? Yeah, I have some questions. First, uh, you know, in your super uh, starter formula, yeah. you mentioned one product there. Uh, it's highly digestible and appetizer yeah. raw materials. So all the uh, raw materials in this formula are really highly digestible and also the very good for the appetizer. Yeah. So what is the what, what kind of product is this? You know, I mean, <laughs> it is you, you want to know everything. Me. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> so it is a top secret product. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So. No, 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 no. Uh, only it's mainly based. This product is mainly based on extruded cereals, biscuits, and something like that. Okay. Okay. We so have a know. saying in the United States. We of could course, of course. I, I, don't, you. I have any <laughs> doubt about that, uh, Marianne. <laughs> yeah, we'd have to kill you after we told you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, some, uh, I think there are two other questions from the attendees. Uh, I think you already uh, answered one of them, but I, I'm going to ask it again, what should be the forage and the concentrate percentage uh, in a in a ration for the uh, short time patterning? Hundred <laughs> <laughs> percent. Yeah, no, no, of course. Yeah, I, I'm not, really, I'm not kidding. If you need look, uh, the speed of fattening for us, it's the big challenge we are facing with our fatteners, okay? Why? We have, look, if, you, if we have in a very good pricing context for, the, for, for lamb meats, okay? So the fatteners says, says for us, we have really to fatten as soon as possible because the prices is, is really very, very good. So we have, I have to, 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 to sell my, my lambs as soon as possible. Believe me, believe me that we formulate today, we have the possibility to formulate at a hundred percent feed without straw, without hay. Okay? Mm -hmm. In order to gain five to seven days for of, of slaughter, which is really huge. Okay? We have this possibility. But it is not really the same recommendations as you can as you can see in this table, for example. 
but we can do that. We can do that. Okay. There, there is, there is we, the, the, first, the first lever about that is really we have to manage the, first of all, the, the, the good ratio and the good quality of energy in order to do that. Okay, the energy, it's still the first limiting factors when we, when we do fattening. Okay. Okay. Very good, thank you. Um, the, the other question is that, when do we need to start feeding the lambs with forage? We should start feeding with concentrate first, then forage, or we should start with forage, then concentrate? I, I prefer to start with, this, is with concentrate with a specific yes. start of feed, okay? Okay, thank you, that was the question. Thank, thank you. you very much. Um, so, uh, Sezgi, do you have any additional questions that you have fielded? Uh, actually, Mr. Hidai has already asked the questions. Thank you for this. So Perfect. I was going to ask same questions. So now I don't know. Okay, perfect, perfect. Question. Thank you. Um, let's see, I, we have a comment that is uh, from one of our, our attendees that they have experience about full concentrate feeding and okay. it has provided very good results for yeah. the lambs. All right, I know John had a couple more um, questions and then I think unless we get more, I believe we've covered everything please alert me if, if you have some questions that are still hanging out there. But um, John, if you want to ask some of the things that you had, and then we'll, we'll say, oh my gosh, thank you so much. <laughs> so <laughs> go ahead, John. Oh, well, Masood, thank you again so much. This is, was, has been a great webinar and I, I appreciate your candidness and, and, your transparency and in, in what you've talked about today. And it's, it's really interesting. Um, I got a couple simple questions. Uh, where, in your opinion, uh, where have we come the farthest in the sheep industry in your career? Where do you think we've come the farthest? Where, where does you, what come the, please? Uh, where do you think the industry has achieved the most success or made the most strides in the industry during your career? Okay. I, I know less really uh, the UK market, okay? Or the, yeah. the, the industrial uh, parts in, the, in, the, in this market. But if we consider the rest of the Europe, yep. I mean, I can, I can speak about French and Spain. Yeah, you, you speak about your experiences. Yeah. Okay. Um, where do you, what do you see as the next big big step in the sheep industry, whether it's management or nutrition? Um, you've spent a long time and a lot, most of your career doing this. Where do you see the next big strides and the next big thing that we can achieve to uh, on this fattening side of sheep? Where do we go from here as an industry? Uh, for, for me, the, we still have a lot, a lot, a lot of business to do in terms of uh, on, of management, or in term in terms of uh, <clears throat> how really to maybe to in terms of organizations of the, of the productions uh, in countries like Romania, like Italy, like uh, like Greece too. Okay, they have a big, a big, a big potential, but the, in terms of organizations, I think that's, that we still have a, a lot of job, a lot of business to do in these countries. You know, uh, I think in, in Spain, they are really well organized, very performant countries in terms of, of productions for, for in lambs, I mean, in French too. But in, in the rest of Europe, uh, yeah, I, I mean, mainly Romania, Greece, Italy, potentially, really there is a big, big organization to do in these countries. Okay. okay. Yep, thank you. No problem. 
Thank you. John, are you all good? I am good. All right. I, um, I need to extend just a very sincere and, and deep felt. Ah, oh, we have another one. Unless it's a comment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> can you see those in the, the question window? Yeah. Um, is that anything we need to address? I'm I'm looking for the help from Hudai Masood or, or Hello, uh, sorry. Are you asking for open <laughs> questions? Sorry. These are for emails. They are, uh, they are asking okay. for the uh, presentation directly for this. Okay. <laughs> no, sorry. Yeah. No, no, that's okay. Not about the uh, questions about this part. It's about uh, an email address and I can share the presentations. Or Thank you so much. Okay. Yes, um, Masood, I've, I've said that I'll turn your presentation into a PDF and yep. link to it on the recording webpage. So I will have a recording of the English language webinar available for anybody to listen to. Um, I am not able to record the Turkish translation. So unless that was recorded in another way that did not get recorded we can explore that in the next webinar to to see how we could capture that um and i would be willing to post that up on our our web page as well um uh, masood thank thank you so much for your terrific thank you for you, um, thank you for really you. really marathon of a presentation and um question period we have so many questions and I think people don't get the opportunity to join these same sort of um, webinars or listen to them in, in the area of sheep production as we have so many available in dairy production. So thank you all. Thank you everybody that helped make this possible. It was really, really um, terrific. There is a question. What DLWG daily weight gain, I believe, would you expect from lambs being fed this concentrate diet? And I believe they're referring to the diet that I have up. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Mayan. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Uh, uh, before you go, if you have time to, to answer yeah. that last question. Masood? Did no, I lose? No, problem. No, no question for me. Yep. Oh, okay. Now I have one last question. Um, that is, what what daily weight gain would you expect from the lambs being fed the concentrate diet? Um, uh, excuse me, Marianne. What? 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 Um, I don't hear what, you very well. What daily weight gain would you expect from lambs being fed the diet that you're showing? Uh, Marianne, it, it depends on the on the breeds. Okay. Uh, this question really it depends on on the breeds first of all, but if we consider if we consider a in a full fattening period, okay, with the with the meat meat breeds, okay, the average the average daily weight gain from the beginning until the end is around 330, 350 grams, the average, I mean, and if we consider in the same system, but with the dairy milk, dairy, dairy breeds. So we we are at about 280 to 300 grams. Okay. okay. Yeah. So there is 50 grams of difference between both. All right. Thank you so much. Um, yes, obviously that would be, it would, it would be the, we would need much more information than, <laughs> than provided there. So again, thank you everybody that joined. Um, and I am saving the chat. So I will have all the people's um, emails that are including them in the chat. And um, I believe the question and answer period automatically gets saved or the question all automatically gets saved. Thank you everyone for joining. And um, please remember to join us in April. Um, Masood, I hope that you are also able to join us. And if you are, I may pull you in as a panelist if you agree. So no problem. That's no problem, Marianne. All okay. right.
<laughs> Thanks okay. very much. Thanks Thank you. you. Um, great job, everyone. And we'll, right. we'll see you. You'll get an email when this is up and ready to listen to. All, okay. right. All right. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.